tonight on Unsolved Mysteries. On a sunny afternoon in Boonville, Missouri, Janice Owen and her eight-year-old daughter Alyssa made their way home within an hour of one another. What happened next stunned the small community and left even the most seasoned cops shaking their heads in disbelief. Tina Creamer was getting a fresh start with a new boyfriend, but she was concerned because her ex-husband had allegedly been stalking her. Then on the night of August 10th, Tina and her boyfriend were murdered. Had Tina's fears been realized? Could this have been a case of love gone wrong? Where is 15-year-old Trisha Autry? At her Utah home, she spent many evenings at her computer. Then she suddenly disappeared. Did Trisha run away to meet someone she met over the internet, or was she abducted against her will? Join me for these stories of heartbreak and intrigue on Unsolved Mysteries. It had been a routine Monday at Riverdale Care Center in Boonville, Missouri, population 8,200. Forty-three-year-old nurse's A. Janice Owen, a widow and hardworking mother of two, finished her shift at the usual time, then headed for home just half a block away. The time was 2.15 p.m. About an hour later, Janice's eight-year-old daughter, Alyssa, was on her way home. A sweet kid with a sunny disposition, Alyssa got along well with everyone. She was riding alone that Monday. Her older brother had been dropped off earlier at the babysitter's. She's a cute little smiling girl. I just noticed her when she got off the bus and walked in front of my bus to get on her property. I watched her angle toward the front door of this residence, and then I was on my way. Later that afternoon, Janice's mother stopped by to say hello. Janice? I tried the door, and it was unlocked. Janice? Hello? Alyssa? She didn't answer me, so I walked on through the house, and she wasn't anywhere to be found in there. Alyssa's coat was on the couch, her backpack on the floor, but Frances found no sign of her daughter or granddaughter. It was now 5 p.m. So I wrote a note that I'd been there, and I thought it was funny that night she didn't call me, but there was nothing messed up or anything that would have given me any idea anything was wrong. 5.45 p.m. A neighbor returning home from work says she saw some unusual activity outside Janice's home. There was people standing outside her duplex. There was cars parked on the street that usually, I, I mean, I've just never noticed before. There was a woman on the porch and there was a younger guy. He was wearing the red baseball cap. They were both facing the street and they both stared at me as I drove by. I kind of thought something was odd about the situation. 15 minutes later, Amy noticed more strange activity outside Janice's home. There was a white four-door car in front of her house, but on the wrong side of the street. And I saw a different guy facing me, looking down towards my end of the street. My intuition was telling me there's something wrong. And I didn't know if it was domestic dispute or what it was. 
But the thought that severe harm would truly happen to anybody, that never crossed my mind. Janice Owen and her daughter Elisa had simply disappeared. And what happened between 3.15 p.m. and 6 p.m. that Monday afternoon at the Owen home would become the topic of much speculation. Police departments from two rural counties soon found themselves handcuffed by a puzzling case, the first of its kind in this area in 20 years. Even big city detectives called to assist in the case could make no sense of the evidence. The next day, Tuesday, 8.45 a.m. On the outskirts of Fayette, Missouri, just 12 miles north of Boonville, three employees from a local sawmill spotted something on the side of the road. Whoa, whoa, stop, 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 up. back up, back up. Oh, stop, 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 stop. At first glance, they thought it was a mannequin. It turned out to be the lifeless body of a young child. Minutes later, the Howard County Sheriff arrived on the scene. There was no signs of any trauma or anything, so we called the coroner and he arrived and, and could determine that she had probably been, you know, at least dead six to eight hours. And well of Sheriff Paulson, Howard County Sheriff's Department. With no reports of any missing children locally, had Sheriff Paulson contacted Boonville Police in neighboring Cooper County. No yeah, I'll check it out and I'll call you back as soon as I know anything. Okay. Detective Bob Welliver made calls to several schools and soon had an answer. Little Alyssa Owen had been absent that day. It turned out to be her body found on the side of the road. Tuesday, 12.15 p.m. Detective Welliver drove over to see Alyssa's mother and deliver the terrible news. No answer. Suspicious, he went inside. Hello? Anybody home? Mrs. Owen? No sign of Anybody Janice home? Owen. I didn't see anything out of the ordinary that would give me any suspicions that there was a struggle. No signs of any blood, no signs of any kind of uh, uh, any trauma or anything. We did not see anything out of the ordinary at the house. Wednesday. Detective Welliver got a call from the coroner. The autopsy revealed Alyssa had died of suffocation. Her mother was not only missing, she had become the prime suspect in a murder case. But what possible motive could she have? Friends say Janice adored her daughter. As the investigation continued, more perplexing questions surfaced about the events of Monday afternoon. Was a woman Amy Pulliam saw on the porch Janice Owen? Amy wasn't sure. She really didn't know her very well. And who were the two men? One wearing a red baseball cap, the other standing by the white car. She didn't know them at all. But Amy was sure of the time. 5.45 p.m., some 45 minutes after Janice's mother told detectives she stopped by the house and found it empty. Alyssa? Excuse me, sir. Lieutenant Welliver, Boonville Police Department. Detectives began canvassing the area for more clues. Another neighbor reported seeing an older model dark-colored pickup truck parked near Janice's home Monday afternoon. Then an employee with a local waste disposal company came forward. He described seeing a similar pickup truck Tuesday morning on the same road Alyssa was found, just minutes before the sawmill workers discovered her body. And as he went by, he was going slow, and I looked at him, he was looking at me, so I waved, and he didn't turn his head away or wave or nothing, just stared and just kept right on going. And the guy was wearing a red ball cap. Jeff Stacy never got a look into the bed of the pickup truck, but he thinks he knows what was there, the body of Alyssa Owen. Jeff was certain she was not lying on the side of the road when he drove by minutes earlier. Whoever dumped her there had to have done it after 8.30 because I was through there not, you know, there's no way the spot she was laying that I would have missed seeing her. Was the man behind the wheel the same one reportedly seen at Janice's home on Monday? And was the dark green pickup truck parked near her home that afternoon the same one spotted near the crime scene Tuesday morning? Detectives searched for answers, but came up empty. 
Over the next month, they chase hundreds of other leads, dead ends at every turn, and still no sign of Janice Owen. Then on March 27, 2002, six weeks after Alyssa's death, tragedy struck again. Janice's body was discovered in a creek bed, some 12 miles from where her daughter had been found. She'd been in the water quite a while, but there were no really serious signs of trauma that we could tell. Everything she had on from work were still there. Her rings and necklaces and earrings and even her eyeglasses were still on her head. The coroner later determined that mother and daughter had died within hours of one another and in the same manner. Janice Owen and Melissa Owen had both been suffocated to death. More questions. Why was Alyssa's body left in plain sight on a well-traveled road, while her mother's body was apparently dumped in a remote creek bed some 12 miles away? And who could negotiate the maze of back roads that crisscross Howard County? Police have plenty of theories, but still no suspects. It's possible to get from either location to the other location if you know the route. It probably has to be somebody local. I just don't believe a stranger could find those two locations separately and just leave. What worries me now is they're still out there. Who knows that they won't try it to somebody else? And I don't want that happening to anybody. I would love to say I have it or that I have any clue. I am a law enforcement officer. I, I am a detective. My job is to leave the options open until I can prove the facts. And I, quite frankly, I don't know. Update. Shortly after we completed the story, there was a major development in the case. Police have arrested 25-year-old Angela M. Mize and her 18-year-old husband, Eric D. Mize. Each is charged with two counts of first-degree murder. The couple live in the Booneville area, and detectives believe they were the man and woman seen lurking outside the home of Janice Owen the day she and Alyssa disappeared. Tina Creamer and Robert Miller met on the job at a Lawton, Oklahoma hospital where they both worked. They had only recently begun dating. The couple planned to spend a relaxing evening at Robert's apartment. While he prepared dinner, Tina took a hot shower to unwind after a long day at work. They were not aware they were being watched. Robert's habit of leaving his front door unlocked would prove tragic. Rob? <gasps> 25-year-old Tina Creamer and 26-year-old Robert Miller never had a chance. Just five days before her murder, Tina Kramer's divorce had become final. Tina and David Kemp had been married for five years. According to Tina, David began stalking her shortly after they were separated. Could their apparently turbulent relationship have anything to do with a double murder? Investigators turned to those who knew the victims for answers. Tina loved the nursing field. She loved helping people, anybody she could help. She did so much volunteer work for people that we didn't even know about till after the fact. According to some, Tina's life with David Kemp was apparently not very fulfilling. I don't believe they had a marriage. I don't believe they had a relationship. I know he had hit her. I know that he was mentally abusive. She had no self-esteem left until after she left him. 
Tina's new boyfriend, Robert Miller, was apparently providing a refreshing change from her controlling ex-husband. Rob was very affectionate, very loving. He brought a lot of love and laughter into her life. She had a lot of confidence. Her self-esteem had just exploded after she had left David. She was a very beautiful woman. This lady was really, really good for him. You know, very supportive, um, you know, made him happy. If this would have never happened, they would have been perfect for each other. The bodies of Tina Creamer and Robert Miller were discovered when they failed to show up for work at the hospital. Rob's best friend, police officer Troy Morris, responded to the scene. I made entry. I, uh, I saw Rob's body lying there on the floor. I was too emotional to continue on, uh, still wanting to preserve the crime scene for our detectives. I backed out of the residence uh, and chose not to go any further. After exiting the residence, I did what police officers aren't supposed to do. I broke down. Uh, I can't describe that feeling. I can't describe it. You know, it was, it was about 11.30 last night. And Tina's family I, I learned what happened from a news report. My husband and I, which is her brother, was watching TV. TV didn't say any names, but it showed the apartment. And we just knew that it was them. Investigators processed the crime scene, and news of the murders began to spread. Many in Tina Creamer's circle had their suspicions who may have been responsible for the cold-blooded murders. And that suspect would soon come to the attention of the police. The first thing that led investigators to uh, seeking the whereabouts of David Kemp was the fact that he had motive. He had made threats to kill himself and to kill Christina uh, when they split up. Robert said on several occasions that uh, David Kemp would come up to Comanche County Memorial Hospital and leave notes on Tina's car stating, uh, if I can't have you, that nobody can. She stated to me a few days before the murders that it was a calm before the storm. Because of threats and letters, Rob knew that Tina feared David. And we would state to him, y'all be careful, you know, watch out for him. Lock your doors. When detectives attempted to locate David Kemp for questioning, they discovered he had suddenly left town the day after the murders without telling anyone where he was headed. David Kemp was now considered a possible suspect. They speculated that when he received the divorce decree, officially dissolving his marriage to Tina, it may have upset him. But would it have been enough to trigger the murders? Although police had no physical evidence to connect David Lee Kemp to the killings, they located a man who claims he sold Kemp a 45 caliber handgun. This person still had in his possession some of the shell casings that he had fired previously through that gun. He provided the shell casings to us and we were submitted them for forensic examination. Those shell casings that were known to be fired through that gun matched identically to the shell casings that we found in the crime scene. Conclusive proof that David Kemp's gun was the murder weapon. An all-out manhunt was launched to track down David Lee Kemp. But where was he? Investigators had exhausted all leads. Then, almost two weeks after the murders, a lucky break arrived from California. We were notified by California Highway Patrol that they had spotted uh, David Kemp's vehicle on a highway just outside of Bishop, California. One Chili One requesting wants on Oklahoma license. Kemp's 1998 Dodge Ram pickup truck had broken down. The police indicated that there was no one around the vehicle. We faxed them a photograph of David Kemp and advised them of uh, what he was wanted for. Then a man fitting Kemp's description was spotted walking along the same highway. Within a few minutes, they called us back and stated that they had tried to approach Mr. Kemp, but that he had fled on foot.
California authorities cornered David Kemp in an auto wrecking yard. The suspected killer was trapped. David Lee Kemp, it's police department. Step out so we can see you. I'm not going to jail, no way! Put the gun down, David. He began to wave the gun about and indicated that he wanted to kill himself. We're going to try and help you, David. What can I do for you? Let us know. We got to know. That he made a few demands, but the one demand that he did make was that he talked to his mother on the telephone. Someone get this guy a cell phone. The request was accommodated. I'm sorry, Mom, I can't do this. Then as Kemp said his goodbyes, he was momentarily distracted. Police sharpshooters armed with non-lethal projectiles saw their opportunity. David Lee Kemp was taken into custody. The standoff was safely over. When uh, David Kemp was taken into custody in uh, Bishop, California, he did have a 45 caliber pistol with him. Subsequent examination indicated that uh, that was indeed the same gun that was used in the homicide. Once extradited back to Oklahoma, David Kemp was assigned to the Comanche County Jail, where he would await trial for the murders of Tina Creamer and Robert Miller. When David was caught and brought back to the jail, we were very happy. We rested at night easier. We were glad he was back so that justice could be served. Six months later, nine inmates at the Comanche County Jail, including David Kemp, overpowered a guard and forced their way to freedom. Eight of the escapees were quickly recaptured. The ninth, David Lee Kemp, was last seen heading toward Texas. When David escaped, we were angry, very angry, empty. Feelings of it being so unfair. It was like hearing my brother getting murdered for the first time. I went to the jail and I stood there and waited. I even went into the search parties. I wanted to make sure that I was gonna do everything I could for Rob to make sure this man, David Lee Kemp, was caught. Personally, I don't know how David can live from one day to the next. He's a coward for what he's done. Three months after the escape, authorities missed an opportunity to take David Kemp back into custody. The night manager of a Las Vegas motel checked to see why a guest hadn't paid his manager. rent. Hello? Hello? Manager, sir? Hello? The manager found the guest sitting in the bathtub, covered with blood, holding a knife to his own stomach in what appeared to be a bizarre suicide attempt that had failed. The man was taken to a psychiatric hospital where his wounds were determined to be nothing more than superficial cuts. The troubled man received treatment and checked himself out. Hospital authorities had no idea that the man was wanted for double murder. The mystery man was David Lee Kemp. Kemp was last seen at a service station on the outskirts of Las Vegas. He was getting into the passenger seat of a black Firebird. It's just a never-ending nightmare. I want satisfaction for my brother, Rob. And that'll be the only way he can rest in peace. Without that, he's gonna be troubled, a troubled soul. Our wounds have not even gotten to heal because they're, David's never been tried. And our wounds won't heal till, till David faces the consequences of what he's done, till justice is served. June 24, 2000, Hiram, Utah. 
Joanne Autry awakens at dawn. Her daughter, Tricia, usually a late sleeper, is not in her bedroom. Trish? A search of the entire house fails to turn up any sign of the teenager. Is Trish there by any chance? As Joanne's concern becomes outright panic, she frantically calls her daughter's friends. Trish's sisters scour the neighborhood. When none of us found her, then I became really frightened. All of a sudden, there was this deep fear, deep knot of fear in my stomach, because it wasn't like Trisha to do this. And I knew that there was something gravely wrong. The sudden and mysterious disappearance of 15-year-old Trisha Autry left her family devastated and the police struggling for clues. In many ways, Trisha is a typical teenage girl energetic and secure and eager to be liked. It was this last desire that may have led Trisha on a dangerous search for romance, a journey that possibly landed her in the clutches of an internet predator. Like many teenagers seeking acceptance, Trisha found adolescence a painful experience. She was a kid that was ostracized in school. Um, the children made fun of her. She didn't have what she really wanted, and that was a really close friend, someone that she could confide all of her adolescent dreams in and be able to share those things with. So she was a pretty sad child from that standpoint, is that she just needed that one special friend. So Mrs. Autry, has there been any fighting? No, there hasn't been. Police immediately zeroed in on Trisha's state of mind as an explanation for her disappearance. We thought it was a typical runaway juvenile case that we usually get from teenagers about that age that uh, just take off. They've got problems at home uh, with friends, depression type of things, and they just leave for a couple of days. Did you make the bed? No, um, I found it like that this morning. There was only one problem with a runaway scenario. Trisha left behind virtually everything she might need while away from home. There literally was nothing taken except the clothes on her back. And so we became convinced that she went simply to meet someone for a few minutes with the idea that she'd be coming back. Trisha often hid from her unhappiness by creating elaborate stories, sometimes attaining secret liaisons with much older men. Two weeks before her disappearance, the teenager told her family she had started a new story. Every night she typed furiously, often staying up until the early morning hours. On the night she vanished, Trisha was again at the computer. I'm going to bed. Good night, see you tomorrow. Her sister Brianne went to bed at 2 a.m. No one in Trisha's family ever saw her again. For Trisha to disappear was totally out of character for her. And what I was hoping was to find in the story that she was writing some clue as to what she was thinking of, what her frame of mind was. And that's why I went immediately there to begin looking. When Joanne turned on the computer, there was no story only a few pages of scattered thoughts. What then had Tricia Autry been doing on the computer for all those countless hours? Computer expert John W. Georgie examined the system and made several disturbing discoveries. Unbeknownst to her mother, Tricia had three separate email accounts and spent an enormous amount of time in chat rooms. Even more alarming was what occurred at 3 a.m. on the night Trisha Autry disappeared. Everything that possibly could be found of who she talked to or what she'd been doing on the computer in the, the recent frame of time was deleted. I, I figured Trish was taught how to delete these files because she did not, from what I was told by her mother, have the experience to know where these files were stored. And I took this as a very bad sign that, you know, it's obviously somebody was trying to cover their tracks. But who could this mystery person have been? Trisha gave no hints to her friends or family that she had met somebody online. 
Neighbors, however, notice suspicious activity near the Autry home on several occasions. About two weeks before she disappeared, one of our neighbors had seen her get out of a red car on the corner. And what he thought was some suspicious behavior is the way she was walking back to the house from the corner, as if she didn't want to be seen. So that was our first report of a red car. According to another neighbor, the red car appeared again at 4 a.m. on the morning Trisha disappeared. The headlights from a car coming up the street kind of struck the bedroom window, got my interest. So I was looking out the window and I saw kind of economy type red car. The young man got out of the car and oh, he was nervous. First thing that popped in my mind, oh, somebody's sneaking out of the house. And after a few minutes, a lady was coming down the street. And they walked to the car together and went on their merry way. I believe that she could be seduced into thinking she found someone who needed her and could love her. I think that she was um, bait good bait for a predator. Hello. Two hours after Tricia was seen getting into the red car, Glenda Tripp, a local convenience store employee, witnessed a strange incident. Are you all right, honey? Yeah, I'm okay, thanks. She seemed really apprehensive and nervous, and she never acted like she was wanting to buy anything, but she kept kind of stretching her little head and looking out the window like she was looking for someone or watching for someone. I've seen her in, in and about the neighborhood, and so I knew Trisha. I have no doubt in my mind that it was Trisha. After spending 20 minutes in the store and making no purchases, Trisha vanished. Over the next two months, the police and the Autrys posted missing posters in the surrounding communities. A man in Bountiful, Utah, saw one of the flyers and immediately contacted the authorities. What Jerry Startup witnessed would cast an entirely new and unsettling light on the case. I had gone into the supermarket to uh, do some shopping I saw coming through the door uh, this young lady, uh, followed by another lady and, and a gentleman lagging behind a little bit to the right of them. The man matched the description of the individual who was seen picking up Trisha from her home. Both he and the woman never let the girl out of their sight and constantly berated her in hushed tones. I looked a little bit closer and saw that her, her eyes were partially closed and uh, her face was a little puffy. Now, my goodness, this, this young lady's perhaps been beaten or abused. I thought she was drugged. She had the appearance of being drugged. Was it Tricia? Yes. How confident am I that uh, that was her? 100%. I knew, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt, that was her. That was her. My feeling right now is she's probably being kept from coming back either by force or by somebody keeping her uh, sedated or on drugs or something uh, that wants to keep her. I, I think this is an abduction type of situation. I don't think it's a typical runaway. For me as a mother, the greatest thing is this is a tiny person that I, I loved and nurtured and worried about and I can no longer protect her. I don't know where she is. When I drive through town and I see things that we would have been sharing together or activities come up that we commonly did together as a family. And she's not there and there's no, I mean, it's sometimes it just, the, the grief just washes over you and it takes your breath away. Since we filmed the story of Tricia Autry's disappearance, investigators from the Sheriff's Department in Logan, Utah have made a tragic discovery. Tricia's case is no longer classified as that of a missing person.
Sadly, it is now a homicide, and a suspect is in custody. Six months after Trisha's disappearance, Cache County Sheriff's deputies became suspicious about the activities of Cody Lynn Nielsen, a maintenance man working for a wildlife research facility in Millville, Utah, eight miles from the home of Trisha Autry. Near the time of Trisha's disappearance, Nielsen had been observed using a backhoe on facility property to dig deep trenches and refill them for no apparent reason. We contacted a cadaver dog team out of Duchesne County here in Utah. And we brought the dogs up to this site. And they, they were real interested. And they, they hit what they called hit on uh, this one area right here that we knew that our suspect had been digging. And the dogs hit on this several times. About seven different dogs hit on this. Sheriff's Department investigators began to dig with their own backhoe at the location suggested by the dogs. When we got to about 10 feet, we found a human jawbone, uh, which later uh, was determined to be Trish Autry's. It was just nothing short of a miracle that we found that piece of evidence in that big of a hole. In other trenches, Sheriff's deputies found more of Trish's remains and clothing some of which had been burned. For Trisha's mother, the news of the discovery brought great pain, but also a sense of relief. Primarily because of our faith, we know where she is now. Where before we wondered, we would lie awake together at night and worry about whether she was in the cold or whether someone was hurting her. It's probably been very agonizing, but also very validating because we knew that she did not run away. Grace Hospital, Richmond, Virginia. On February 9, 1965, a shadowy figure holding a tiny infant slipped silently down the hall. The child had been diagnosed with congenital glaucoma, Hi, I'm here to a rare condition process. present at birth that leads to complete blindness unless surgery is performed within the first few months of life. The woman who said her name was Mary Carson gave the child's name as Kim, her age, two and a half months. I heard the baby whimper. Here, let me hold her. Nurse supervisor Billy Updike held the little girl while Mary completed November. admission papers. November 26, 1964. However, She's Billy beautiful. was stunned by what she heard next. We talked for a minute, and then she said, I've got to go now. I'll be back tomorrow. I have some older children Mary told Billy she had two older children at home that couldn't be left alone. She said she would return first thing in the morning. She'll have the very best of care. She seemed very calm. She didn't display any emotion at all. And I would have been crying and heartbroken if I'd had to leave my baby. Perhaps it affected Mary far more than she let on, but Billy would never know. When she returned to work the next day, she was shocked to learn that Mary had failed to show up for her baby's operation. Number disconnected. I'll notify administration. Without her, doctors could not perform the surgery. Desperate, hospital administrator Douglas Pace attempted to track Mary down himself. I went out to the address looking for the mother, and I found a vacant lot all the houses had been demolished and the block was completely vacant. I was stunned and shocked and uh, it made me feel kind of sad that uh, I realized then we had a baby on our hands without a parent. With time running out, Douglas Pace convinced the judge to issue a court order allowing doctors to perform the surgery. The operation was considered a success, but Kim's eyesight would never be normal. An article in the February 11, 1965 edition of the Richmond Times generated an outpouring of sympathy, donations, and adoption inquiries. 
but the coverage failed to turn up one solid clue as to who had abandoned baby Kim. A police investigation also led nowhere. 18 months, numerous operations, and several foster homes later, another report in the Times caught the eye of local residents Richard and Sandra Butler. Sandra's husband, Richard, was especially taken by the heart-wrenching story. This is gonna be my baby. This is what he said. End of discussion. If he thinks we're gonna do this, I'll go along with him. We made a mine up from the start. We wanted her, and we got her. Sandra and Richard opened their home and their hearts to the toddler they named Kimberly Dawn. Kim was treated exactly like the butler's two biological children. But her poor eyesight made life a constant struggle. I do remember being very angry, being very frustrated um, about not being able to go and, and do a lot of things that other children could do, which was hard because on one hand, they wanted me to grow up very normal, but yet I couldn't do all the normal things. Despite her disability, Kim graduated from high school, attended college, and went to work as a teacher. In 1989, she married Michael Smith, the deputy sheriff. Over the years, Kim showed little interest in learning about her birth parents until she became a parent herself. Once I became a mom and had two children and could tell you to this day every moment about uh, the day they were born, the time, how much they weighed, their birth dates. I started thinking, I don't know any of those things about me. But it was more than curiosity that led Kim to search for her identity. As a baby, her son Tyler had suffered from repeated bouts of respiratory infections. Doctors feared the cause was genetic. That was kind of like the straw that broke the camel's back after going to several doctors and being able to tell anything they needed to know about Mike's side of the family. That was kind of what made me decide that it was time for me to start a search. If I could just find those answers to all those questions I have, and most importantly, find the medical history for my children and I, that, that's what I'm in search of. That's what I hope to, to gain. Kim is understandably concerned for the health of her children, yet she harbors no anger against her birth mother. We always were led to believe that she left me because maybe she couldn't afford the medical treatment I would, I would need having congenital glaucoma. I can't be angry at her about that. She could have not taken me to the hospital. She could have not registered me for the surgery. Therefore, I might not have any sight today. Kimberly Smith was dropped off at a Richmond, Virginia hospital on February 9th, 1965. With every mystery, a single critical clue may be the key to a solution. Perhaps you hold that key. Join us for the next edition of Unsolved Mysteries.